Shalom. Karim Lee, Mike Russo. Nice to be here to see everybody in beautiful Herzliya. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and talk today about practical guide to signal integrity from simulation to measurement. So we can talk about theory and device physics and all of these things, but I want to give an intuitive understanding to you of what it means to be the signal. So much like professional athletes, they tell the athletes, be the ball. Basketball, Golden State Warriors, Steve Curry, uh, yeah, thank you. Well, so I, there's an analogy to electrical engineers to be the signal. In fact, there's even a website, bethesignal.com. Dr. Bogatin, I'm sure you all know, a good friend of mine and co-author of our book, Signal Integrity Characterization Techniques. So I, I want to do this, this gut feeling to help you understand to be the signal and what it feels like to propagate through a channel. So this will be the, the focus of our discussion today. So a lot of material. I'm going to try not to go too fast, but here we go. So right now we have signal integrity happening. I'm the transmitter, and I'm transmitting the signal to all of you. So I'm the transmitter, you're the receiver. Between us, we have a channel, which is the media, which is air. But if we were outside in the pool underwater, and I was talking to you, we'd have a different propagation velocity because of the media changing, yeah? Would, our, would the voice travel faster or slower in water? It would go faster. The molecules are closer together, the propagation velocity is faster, which means the, the time propagation delay is shorter, okay? So the media, or the interconnect as we call it, is critical to a channel. So we must think about this. And so I want to start with a general idea. We have some type of transmitter. It could be a CPU. Um, and we have some type of receiver, like an LED display, whatever, and the channel in between. And a quote by Dr. Bogatin says, signal integrity is about the problems interconnects introduce and how to avoid them. So this is what we want to try and do. Hyperscale data network centers are controlling all of the Internet of Things today. And so if we talk a little bit about this, we have components, transmitters, receivers get put into modules, and those get mounted into line cards with lots of copper. Then they go into network systems and switch and routers and racks, and we transmit along optical fiber. But here in the copper is where we want to focus today. And here inside the data centers is where the problem is many signal integrity problems, specifically in these components here. Cables, connectors, backplanes, or PCBs. Linear, passive, interconnect. Many times they're the last thing that people think about when designing a system, but they can fail a system and bring it to its knees very quickly. So what we want is we want a platform where we can look at both simulation and measurement inside these systems for high-speed digital design. So if we have a platform that can do both, we used to be able to get away with one or the other. Maybe just simulation, maybe just measurements. You do one and then you take the data, you throw it over the cubicle to the other guy in the other group, he takes care of his stuff, and magically it all comes together. Today this is not the case. We must do both together in conjunction to solve this problem. And so you compare results, and you correlate. If they correlate, wonderful. You move on to the next project. If they don't, you must recycle the same thing. So what we're going to do is have a virtual case study and look at what type of analyses are critical. And so we will look at simulating the channel, three steps. Simulate the channel, find the root cause of the degradation, and then explore design solutions with a very simple design case study. So what are the analyses we must do? Eye diagrams, very fundamental, yes. We must look at mixed mode S parameters. We all know S parameters. Do we know mixed mode S parameters? This is something we will talk about. Of course, TDR, time domain reflectometry, very intuitive, impedance versus distance. Very intuitive. And then we'll look at something called single pulse response. 
And of course, we still have the transmitter and the receiver with the media in between, and we can use um, IBIS AMI models to simulate the active parts of the component. On the measurement side, we can do the same exact thing. We can use a vector network analyzer such as this one. This happens to be a flagship 120 gigahertz vector network analyzer with the heads down there. Uh, what's the effective system rise time of 120 gigahertz VNA? Effective system rise time. In other words, if it were a TDR, how fast would the edge of that TDR be? Right? You go between FFT, IFFT, time and frequency domain. The answer is six picosecond rise time. Extremely fast. And why do we want fast rise time to stimulate a channel under test? That way we get very small resolution physically between adjacent impedance discontinuities. Otherwise, if it's too slow of a rise time, you could have two that are a millimeter apart, but it looks like one. So we want very high frequency VNAs or very fast rise time TDRs to do our measurements. And it's the same figures of merit. I diagram, mixed mode S parameters, time domain reflectometry. And again, the channel, the green graphic represents the S parameters of the linear passive interconnect, the media. And we have IBIS AMI models on either side to do simulation. So we have models, and then we have measurement. S parameters are either touchstone file or city file. OK, let's jump into the case study. First step, let's simulate the channel. We have a transmitter. It's going to send very fast edges, very sharp, perfect transmitter. Send it through a FR4, which is a lossy material, right? What's going to happen? We're going to close the eye. There's two types of loss. What types of loss do we have? We have a dielectric loss, right, FR4. Is that a series or is that a shunt? This is a shunt loss, that's correct. What's the other type of loss? Skin effect loss, right? When the current crowds on the outside, and this is a series loss. Both are important. So when we construct eye diagrams from PRBS, if I went into the theory, I could say something like, uh, we measure S parameters, we extract the impulse response, then we do convolution with the virtual pattern generator, and then we fold each bit period onto each other but I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna try and give you intuitive understanding. If we look at the bit train that the receiver sees, we take two unit interval slices, and we slice this bit train that goes on for the whole length of the pattern, and then we just lay them on top of each other. Boom, we get the eye diagram. This is true for either type of oscilloscope, equivalent time sampling oscilloscope, or real time oscilloscope. No difference. So if we look at the receiver, of course, we're going to have something that's not very clean. And this is what we need to figure out what's going on. What's causing this degradation? Well, let's look at investigating the S parameters. Very precise sine wave generated by the VNA goes into port one. What comes back is return loss. What transmits through? Insertion loss. And both of those are defined by convention here. And the nomenclature, we understand, first is the output number, then the input. S21, one is the input, two is the output, right? Now, we know high-speed digital is not single-ended. Most of it is differential, right? So what we want to do is we want to look at differential stimulus, differential response. So we have mixed-mode S parameters with voltage that's differential and common and the response that's differential in common. So if we have a single, let's say it this way, a differential channel with two input, two output, that's a four-port measurement, right? How many S-parameter elements in a four-port measurement? 16, right? Looks like this. We've seen this before, yes? Quadrant one is differential stimulus, differential response. This is how the device behaves in the real world. So this is how we first analyze the performance. And typically, the most important 
differential insertion loss. The second most, differential return loss. Quadrant four in the lower right, common in, common out. Not so important, but we get it for free. The interesting S parameters to me are quadrants two and three, upper right, lower left. This is what we call mixed mode S parameters. Why do we care? Because this tells us about crosstalk. Mode conversion can locate not only the amplitude of crosstalk, but when you use frequency and time domain, multi-domain analysis, you can find where in the channel the crosstalk structure is happening. Okay? So quadrant two, common in, com common in, differential out. Is this EMI susceptibility or EMI emissions? 50-50 chance. Go ahead and guess. No penalties for wrong answer. No? Well, there is reciprocal, but I don't want to go there yet. Let's look at it this way. In quadrant two, with common in, differential out, let's say we have a perfect differential design of a transmission line, perfectly symmetric, one leg to the other leg. Any common energy incident on that perfect differential pair should do what? Should be rejected. CMRR, common mode rejection ratio, is why we go to differential topology. However, what if one leg has a piece of solder during manufacturing, perhaps? So now there's asymmetry. It's not symmetric at that point in time. So that common energy now incident on that asymmetric pair can be converted from common energy into differential, ride along inside the channel with the real data. So at the receiver, there's a small delta voltage due only to that incident radiation. We call that EMI susceptibility, okay? So we can start looking at mode conversion and S parameters to help us locate problems of, of EMI. Quadrant three, differential in, common out. This is EMI emissions. What's an intuitive way to think of this? How about the transmitter is transmitting differential signal into our perfect channel, no problem. But we inject that into a asymmetric channel when that differential signal encounters that asymmetry, it then converts from differential to common and radiates. This is EMI emissions. And there is a relationship between quadrants two and three. So what are the important mixed mode S parameters? Differential return loss, differential insertion loss, mode conversion, which is the EMI generation, and also EMI susceptibility. Mode conversion can tell us about crosstalk. Okay, rule number nine. Eric Bogatin has these rules of thumb. They can be helpful. Let's expect what we should get, what answer, before we do the simulation, before we do the measurement. What do we think will happen? For differential return loss, what should we get? For di differential insertion loss, what should we get? Basically, we want to fill out this table here with expectations and then follow through to figure out what they are. So let's talk about this virtual channel. We have a three inch microstrip, and then we have a via, and then a three inch strip line. Very simple, with FR4 material. If we do a cross section of the microstrip, we can see that the height of the dielectric is seven mils, seven thousandth of an inch. If we look at the width of the trace, 14 mils. Roughly, what do you think the impedance will be of one of these single-ended lines? What's a typical target for single-ended impedance? 50 ohms, this is correct. So this is one of the rules of thumb. When the width divided by the height is around two, you're gonna have about 50 ohms impedance. Okay, very simple, straightforward. When the separation is here, 42 mils, does this coupled or uncoupled? When it's three times or more of the width, it's uncoupled. So we can say that this is gonna be about 100 ohms differential. The solder mask changes this homogeneous, uh, non-homogeneous dielectric system slightly, okay? So this is our microstrip. How about the strip line? FR4 on the top and on the bottom, we have about 10 mils of thickness of dielectric. 
eight mils of width here in the trace, roughly what do we think the impedance will be? Again, 50 ohms, and the rule of thumb here for strip line is, let's see this over here so I don't fall off, between 0.8 and 1 of the width divided by the height is about 50 ohms, okay? So we expect around 100 ohms differential impedance. So now we've got two elements in this table where there's six. So let's keep going. Let's say we have a data rate that's 32 gigabits per second, which gives us a Nyquist frequency of half that, 16 gigahertz. Estimated loss in FR4, 0.1 dB per inch per gigahertz, right? So we can say three inches times a 16 is 40, 48. Let's call it 50 times 0.1 is 5 dB for each segment, three inch microstrip, three inch strip line. Okay? We're more than halfway there. What about the via? Well, first, let's look at the expectations for the S parameters. For this section here, because there's good match between the microstrip and the strip line, we should have less than 30 dB of differential return loss. Likewise, we have 5 dB for each section, add them linearly because it's log, and then we will say minus 10 dB straight line at 16 gigahertz. This is what we should get when we simulate this virtual channel. What do we get when we do that? Well, we don't get that. Here we get much more reflection, much more return loss than we expect. Goes from minus 30 up to minus 10 dB. And we don't have a straight line. We have a big dip just before 20 gigahertz. What's going on? That's not what we expected. But this is okay. We still have to guess before it happens. Well, how about we, tr we simulate just the transmission lines without the via? When we do that, we get the straight line we expect. Ah. Now we're getting somewhere. We put the via in, lo and behold, we see the dip again. So now we're thinking it's probably the via that's causing this problem, okay? So let's talk about vias. Differential via structures look like this. In this design case studies, we pick a nice round number, 75 mils, for the length of the via stub. Again, the data rate with the Nyquist, and we look at the 80 gigahertz bandwidth we get here, a wavelength is 6 inches per nanosecond for the 80 gigahertz, which is about 75 mils. So lo and behold, one wavelength fits into this stub. Well, that by definition is what a microwave transmission line is. So we no longer can treat this as a lumped element. We must treat it like a distributed element because the voltages and the currents will vary in magnitude and phase over this physical length. Okay, so now we have to think of this like a transmission line. And this is our challenge as digital designers. You know, the microwave guys like to think that they're, you know, more difficult engineering problems. But when you look at these backplanes with hundreds of channels, all of these vias, this is much more complicated than one microwave net. So, so these are real engineering issues that we need to solve. And this is what we're going to do to solve them. Let's take a look at just impedance discontinuities and reflection and, and gamma, reflection coefficient. If we have a strip line situation like this where the trace narrows, if this is 50 ohms, should that be higher or lower impedance? Should be higher, that's right. And if we look at Z2 and we send a voltage wave propagating through here, we'll get some reflection and we use the calculation for reflection coefficient of the difference divided by the sum, and we get this result here, and this tells us that Z2, if it's a short, we have minus one as gamma. If it's perfectly 50 ohms, gamma is zero. It means it's a perfect match, which is always our goal. And if there's an open circuit, gamma is one. Full reflection in phase, okay? Now, let's talk about the via stub. I'm getting a little bit of a drink here just to I've got a sore throat here from traveling. When you go on the jet airplane, you get dehydrated, and 14-hour flights are really no fun. Okay, so if we look at the voltage waves propagating through here, there's gonna be one voltage wave 
flowing in the, in the main direction that we want it to, and some of it's going to flow through that via. And if we look at the voltage wave that travels from left to right, we can see that it's going to look something like this, and we can mark a cursor at the peak and then look at quarter wavelength intervals. And this is the way that the voltage wave is flowing the way that we want it to. But the way we don't want it to is it's going to flow through this transmission line called the via. And with the length lambda over 4, with that open circuit, gamma is going to be 1. We're going to reflect all the way back. And this is a round trip, right? Up and back. So we know it's lambda over 2. So this is going to be the delay, lambda over 2. When we combine those two, what's going to happen? We have a quarter wave stub resonance. Exactly. So this is where the frequency and the physical length of the stub is a quarter wavelength. Seems like nothing's being transmitted. We have a virtual short. OK? So this is what happens when we have vias that are transmission lines. And we can do all these calculations, and we end up with another rule of thumb. Uh, the resonant frequency in gigahertz is equal to 1 and a half divided by the length in inches. Okay, so for FR4, this is a very good approximation. So we're going to expect for FR4, we're going to have a resonance around 20 gigahertz for this 75 mil length via. Lo and behold, this is our dip. So this is what we noticed that we were surprised by. We've gone through the reflection algorithms and the intuitive feeling that we thought the via was going to cause the problem. In fact, that's what caused the problem. So the stub can be the, the possible route. Let's do another verification. How about we look at this degradation with TDR, time domain reflectometry. So we know the characteristic impedance can be calculated this way using gamma. The way a, a TDR system works, it's usually an oscilloscope, equivalent time sampling scope with a TDR module that gets plugged in. Uh, it could be like that um, DCA uh, 86100 with the 12 picosecond rise time, 200 millivolt amplitude step. That incident step is launched into a channel. Some of that is going to be reflected, and some of that is going to be transmitted, depending upon how big the impedance discontinuity is at the input of your channel. And we do the ratio of the reflected to the incident, and that's how we achieve gamma, the reflection coefficient. So what do we expect the impedance profile will be before we simulate? Again, thinking what it should be before we do it. Well, we know we have a 100-ohm test cable coming into the device. Here in the microstrip, we have about 100 ohms, a little bit less maybe. We don't know yet exactly what the via is for the impedance, but we know the strip line is going to be around 100 ohms, and then it goes open. So if we look at the, uh, the via structure again to estimate the impedance, what happens when we have a voltage wave that's coming in at this node and it sees two 100 ohm lines in parallel. What impedance will it see? We'll see 50 ohms. Two 100 ohm lines in parallel is going to give us 50 ohms. Lo and behold, we do the TDR simulation. We see that, in fact, here it's 70 ohms. We're a little bit off, but this explains the dip in the time domain. OK? So now we can conclusively say the via stub is the root cause of the eye closure. And we verified that in the frequency domain and the time domain. And we, the, the explanation that we understand is that the via stub is resonating at a frequency close to the Nyquist and degrading the frequency spectrum of the input signal. So this is what's happening. So we went through the simulation. We were trying to guess ahead of time what was happening. We go through and we verify step by step what we were guessing. We can guess wrong. It's OK. It's better to exercise and think about it before doing the simulation or the measurement and not knowing what to expect. Just as Steve Sandler said earlier, when you're looking into doing something, you want to expect an answer before you do it. This is always a good exercise. So now that we know what the problem is with the vias, what do we do? How do we get rid of vias? We back drill. 
Exactly. So the back drilling the vias, and you have to make sure not to go too far with the drill, right? That'll open circuit. So they usually leave a little bit of a stub, which is really no problem. And when you do that, you open up the eye, problem solved. But sometimes the eye opening is not quite enough, especially if you have a long channel between transmitter and receiver. Remember some of these switches and routers and the hyperscale networks? They can be very long cables or very large backplanes. So the eye may need to be open more. What's another solution that you can do to the active components to open the eye at the receiver? Equalization? How about, how about DFE? Yeah? Let's try adding some equalization at the receiver. Decision feedback equalization. But how many taps do we add? We don't know. How many, how many taps? Well, let's try and figure out how many taps we need. To do that, we use single pulse response, OK? So we send in a, a very sharp single pulse, infinite rise time, perfectly fat, flat amplitude. And of course, it gets degraded by the channel in some way. Slower rise time, because we attenuate the high frequencies due to that shunt dielectric loss of the FR4, and the amplitude decreases, right? So. What we're going to do is we're going to take that resultant pulse and divide it into one unit intervals, which each of these dots represent a tap. The peak we're going to define as the cursor. Any of the taps before in time are precursors. Likewise, any of the taps after the cursor are called post-cursor. So the way the decision feedback equalization works is it takes a symbol detector, feeds it back through decision algorithm, and adds it back in. So the goal is if the circuit detects a one logic level, it will emphasize the next zero. When we do that, this is what it looks like. We detect a one, so we emphasize the zero for each tap below. When we do that, we end up opening the eye even more, which now is adequate for these longer channels. Anytime you see an eye diagram with these jagged lines like this, you can bet nine times out of 10, they've done some DFE equalization. And this is perfectly fine, but my point is you don't want to, you don't want to depend on the active equalization in the beginning. You want to take the raw physical channel and design it as well as high of signal integrity as you can possibly before you do this equalization. That way you, you save room later if you have another project next year that doubles the data rate. You may be able to use the same design. Okay? And of course, if you look at the eye diagram now, before and after the DFE, the eye opens up much more. So this works. And understanding signal integrity in the ideal world, we can use these design case studies and look at multi-domain analysis will be the key. Just like speaking Hebrew and English is a big talent that most of you have, I do not have this, but speaking frequency domain and time domain is also a big benefit. So I would encourage you to, to use as many domains analysis as possible, including this new single pulse response to get very good channels in the end. Okay, so that's the simulation side of things. How about the measurement? Let's talk about this for a little bit. So with the measurements, we can use Vector Network Analyzer or a TDR. So it doesn't matter, we can do FFT, IFFT. The native, native domain you take the measurement in is really of no consequence. The only difference I would say, there is one difference, though, between a VNA and a TDR. Who knows what the main difference might be? I'm, I'm, I'm looking for two words. I'm looking for dynamic range, OK? Dynamic range has to do with the input bandwidth of the receiver of the hardware making the measurement. So, a scope, which is a time domain reflectometer, is a broadband instrument. And if you look at the bandwidth, uh, the bandwidth, the, the, the voltage bandwidth, 
how do I want to say this? The noise floor is square root of 4KRT delta F. Delta F is that input bandwidth to the receiver. So the scope has very wide input bandwidth, so the noise floor of that instrument will be high, which gives it low dynamic range, right? But the VNA can have a very narrow bandwidth, we call IF bandwidth, that's programmable. You can set it to be one kilohertz or one hertz. Now, the measurement takes a long time, but you make that, that input bandwidth to the receiver of the VNA be very narrow, that 4KRT delta F, that delta F is very small now. So it gives you very low noise floor, very wide dynamic range. So why do we care about dynamic range? If you're going to do a lot of data analysis, simulation, or measurement, the dynamic range gives you more accuracy, especially if you're trying to measure low signal levels. What's an example of a low signal level? Crosstalk, right? OK, enough of that. So with the measurements in the real world, what we're going to do is we have to prepare the instrument, we have to acquire the data, and then we analyze the channel performance. So these are all the things that we need to take care of in the hardware world that we normally don't have to in the software world. So let's get into this a little bit. We've got some workspaces for you to look at if you want to. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about calibration and de-embedding. It's a very interesting topic, a lot of opinions on this. Fundamentally, what is the difference between calibration and de-embedding? There's one fundamental difference. Calibration is pre-measurement. De-embedding is post-measurement, OK? One is before you make the measurement, one is after the measurement. Both of them move the reference plane. This is true. For calibration, the target is the instrument itself. For de-embedding, the target is the measurement itself. What are the reference structures for calibration? Well, we can do SOLT. We can do TRL or TRM. These are different types of calibrations that VNA can use. With the TDR, you, you can also do SOLT because there's an eCal now that goes down to DC, which is very clever. On de-embedding, the reference has to be either a 2x through of your fixtures or a 1x open or a 1x short. How do you get a 1x open of your fixture? You simply pull the fixture out of the back plane and you get an open circuit and it looks at that reflect where gamma is 1, reflects the open, and you can actually calculate from S11 S22, S21, S12, you get the full model of that fixture using something called automatic fixture removal. You can also do measurement-based modeling. So these are two very important tools to get more accurate measurements. It's all under the umbrella of error correction, okay? And you can use multiple versions of each. You don't have to do just one, okay? So let's go the right direction here. Here's a typical vector network analyzer in a Pixie chassis. This thing is scalable. Each slot is a separate two-port vector network analyzer with its own stimulus and response circuitry built in. It can be standalone two-port, or you can fully populate the chassis and have a 32-port S-parameter measurement. Oh my god, why would you want to do that? Well, if you want to punish yourself with a calibration like that, actually, a calibration with eCal and 32 ports takes less than 15 minutes. Not, not as bad as you think. But why would you want to measure 32 ports? Well, let's think about it. QSFPDD. This is the cable that I showed with the hyperscale network architecture that connects these racks and the pizza box. They go from patch cable to patch cable. This is a... Um, it's got eight differential channels in that one cable. Eight differential channels means 16 input, 16 output. There's your 32 ports. So you can use a 32 port scalable VNA, measure every single possible crosstalk combination, near end and far end, in one measurement. Pretty amazing, 
pretty amazing. So we're moving the reference plane. When you first turn on the instrument, you hit the button. The reference plane is at the front panel of the, the instrument itself. And then we do SOLT with either mechanical, CalKit, or eCal to the end of the cables. And as I mentioned, you may have some type of fixture that connects coaxially from the cables to your device under test. And this is what must be de-embedded. So in this case, you would do both calibration and de-embedding. Perfectly fine. And the way after you make this measurement, you've, you've calibrated out the cables, you've de-embedded the fixtures, now you have the raw S-parameter nugget of that calibrated device, right? So you can look at multi-domain analysis, just like in the simulation world, you can do it in the measurement world. You can look at multi-domains, eye diagram, insertion loss, return loss, time domain reflectometry, PAM4. You can also do equalization and pre-emphasis. Okay? So again, having a platform where you can do both uh, software and hardware correlation is increasingly critical at these new hyperscale speeds. So if you do the channel uh, before and after equalization, of course, you get a much more open eye. And with that, I will summarize the case of the failing virtual channel. So we looked at various types of analyses and figures of merit. We have eye diagrams, mixed mode S parameters, TDR, single pulse response. We can do it in both software and hardware and then correlate the two. So I want to offer some resources for you. We have some very nice technical libraries that you sign up, you just give your contact information. We have very strict anti-spam policies, um, so you don't have to worry about getting any spam. But if you go to these um, links, you can also download a free PDF of my signal integrity book here that I co-authored with Dr. Bogatin. And then here's some workspaces if you're familiar with our ADS. And of course, we have a YouTube channel also. So with that, I think I would like to say uh, toda. Thank you very much. Looking at the frequency in which we anticipated uh, the resonance to be due to via stub, uh, we did not uh, take into account the fact that the epsilon in the via is much higher than four. It can be usually like 15 due to different uh, propagation modes and something like that. It is seen at the simulation uh, software. Is it correct? So um, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that the epsilon, the dielectric the emissivity of the via can be much different than typical FR4. Uh, this can be very true. It depends on the architecture and topology of the via, if you have um, the via anti-rings anti around the middle, it depends on the depth, how many different layers you're going through. Sometimes you can even have hybrid PCBs with different dielectric materials. So it can get a bit more complicated, absolutely. I, for the sake of conversation, I wanted to keep it a little bit simple here to get the concept, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, good point. Yes, yeah, so you talked about uh, two types of uh, moving uh, the reference plane, as in the embedding and uh, calibration. Um, I'm, I'm, I presume they're not uh, quite equal. Can you give a few words about the, the differences uh, between them? Or, um, I mean, how, I, I, each of them, uh, how good it as it, how, it, how do you move them, the, this, um, the, this reference plane? Yeah, this is a good question. This topic of general error correction, there's actually a lot of misinformation and, and just plain wrong terminology used everywhere. So I, I don't, I can, I can completely understand confusion about this. Again, what I try and do is, is keep it simple and categorize everything as error correction, number one, and then break it down into pre-measurement and post-measurement. So everything that's pre-measurement, I define as calibration. Now for calibration, 
you can have different types for either VNA or TDR. The VNA most common is short open load through, where you screw the standards on to a coaxial cable. But sometimes you want to move the reference plane pre-measurement closer to the device under test, then you would use the TRL, through reflect line. But you can also do other things like port extension, which really, um, or gating, right? These are things I didn't talk about. Very simplistic, but not very accurate. So what you end up doing is having a multitude of error correction techniques, including de-embedding, that vary as far as effort it takes to do them versus the accuracy. And as a general rule of thumb, the more difficult it is, the more accurate it is. So gating and port extension are very easy. They're not accurate, okay? I would only use those types of error correction if I was doing a quick and simple uh, derivation for myself. If I were going to do a paper or publish something or give uh, information to a manager for a big decision, I would never do port extension or, or gating. I would, do, I would do calibration. And then de-embedding itself, the de-embedding algorithm that's done post-measurement, the algorithm itself is not complicated. Many different tools can do this. The trick is getting an accurate model of the structure that you want to de-embed. How do you do this? You can try and measure the fixture, but the fixture normally does not have nice coaxial connectors on each end. Normally, there's coaxial on the input, but the output of that fixture is going to be some other connector, like an like a Air Max or uh, whatever. So in this case, the easiest way that I found to get that accurate S parameter for de-embedding is this automatic fixture removal. Okay, the alternative is to do modeling and measurement together. Okay, so it, this is actually a topic we could talk for another hour on, but uh, it's, it's, um, it's very interesting. I would encourage you to do a little more research. Go to our website, download uh, one of our app notes. It's called um, the ABCs of AFR. Okay. Yeah. Hi, um, I would like to ask about uh, equalization. Um, I've seen in uh, some uh, real applications how uh, equalization indeed can affect and improve performance, as, as you stated, uh, but I've also seen uh, that it has tremendous effect on uh, radiated emission. Uh, it can improve radiated emission or make it worse. So I would like to ask you if, if, uh, if there is any good approach on how to adjust the precursor, coarser, or post coarser uh, in order to improve performance, but not make radiated emission any worse. Yeah, yeah, Th this is a challenge. This is always a challenge. As, as with, with any type of um, uh, equalization, whether it's CTLE, DFE, um, whatever, there's, there's some downsides and, and the radiated emissions of electronics inside the receiver or the transmitter for that reason are going to have a lot more emissions. And, and this is the, the fundamental reason why I, I try first to emphasize work on the raw channel by itself first. Do the back drilling, carefully lay out all the vias, and, and try to make the physical channel itself as best as you can, then rely on that DFE and, and the, the electronics as a secondary way to improve the eye opening. Um, you, you may have to do extra ground shielding. You may have to, instead of using a virtual ground in a differential pair, you may have to go ground signal, ground signal, ground, which takes up more real estate and, and may not be that great of a solution, but it will help the radiation.